Um, I've had a couple people come up to me in the last uh, half hour saying, boy, it's, it's kind of logical how this whole thing was put together. And I reply by saying, you know, that's weird because I had no idea what was going to happen. Um, Rich Tappel and I have uh, been planning this for about nine months. And uh, to see it actually come into uh, fruition and to see all of you here and to see the panels connect and to be able to um, host tonight's conversation with the great Dr. Victor Davis Hansen. Um, I, am, I am so blessed to be here. So thank you all. Um, it could be said that this is a man who uh, needs no introduction, but I will give one anyway. Uh, it is great to welcome back Dr. Victor Davis Hansen here to Pepperdine in the School of Public Policy. Victor has taught here in the past as our Simon Visiting Professor and has multiple connections here to the school. And it is, uh, it is both an honor and a pleasure to continue this relationship uh, tonight. I thought it was particularly appropriate that uh, Dr. Hansen would be our speaker tonight. Uh, in his Wikipedia uh, description under occupation, it says, and I quote, writer, historian, farmer. <laughs> and I thought that was pretty, pretty well descriptive of the kind of people uh, that can support a conservatism of connection. Uh, Dr. Hansen is the writer of over a dozen books, the latest of which uh, from last year, 2017, is the Second World Wars, How the First Global Conflict Was Fought and Won. Uh, he is an incredible writer, uh, writes on a wide range of topics, but uh, when we were putting together the plans for this keynote night and this keynote conversation, and uh, we're thinking about someone who has uh, analyzed and understood not only where we are politically, but culturally. Uh, Dr. Hansen was certainly at the top of our list. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Victor Davis Hansen. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be back here at Pepperdine. Um, for four years, I, I drove seven, I think it was 16 Mondays, Jim Wilburn asked me to teach here, and uh, I got to know the 405, the 101, and the traffic patterns, but I came every Sunday night and taught the graduate course at the school of Pepperdine. And I, I really enjoyed it. It was a wonderful experience. I thought I'd speak for about 30 minutes and open it up to questions. Uh, have you noticed that Donald Trump incites civil war in every institution you're affiliated with? <laughs> At the Hoover Institution, we're having a civil war. At National Review, we're a writer, we're having a civil war. I think the war's over at the Bradley Foundation I'm on the board, but it's everywhere. So I guess it's good in some sense that there's a, a turmoil. But I'd like to uh, ask ourselves collectively whether Trump was a catalyst or would be a symptom. If he didn't exist, would we have to invent him? I kind of think that we would. Whether we knew it or not, over the last 30, 40 years of the end of the Cold War and the globalized project, there were people who were not engaged in it or were not a beneficiary of it, and they, had a, they were developing a different view of it. And unfortunately, when you have ideological uh, divides, if they're compounded geographically, as we know from the Civil War, then it's a false multiplier. And if you look at what was happening on the East and West Coast that, of course, had physical proximity to the, the wider world, you can see that, and if I can be reductionist, if it's okay with you, anybody who had used muscular labor, that task could be Xeroxed abroad. So if you were a small farmer and you were growing raisins, the Greeks could do it cheaper. Couldn't really do it cheaper in real dollars, but because of subsidies and, and EU practices. And I saw uh, the price of raisins go from $1,400 to $400 one year. Wiped out about 70% of the people that lived on my avenue. If you were a lathe worker, if you were a fabricator, if you were an assembler, anything that could be done elsewhere physically, uh, elsewhere. anything that could not, journalism, academics, law, finance, insurance, was not only not Xerox, but it was magnifi magnified in value because the market went from 300 million to six, or now 7.6 billion people. And it tended to create a self-fulfilling prophecy. It wasn't just enough that people in Youngstown, Ohio, or Bakersfield, California, 
were not as successful as people in Palo Alto. It wasn't just that Amazon or Facebook or Apple or the Google companies were all on the coast or 20 top universities in the world, 17 of them in the United States, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Caltech, they're all on the coast. That's where all the major corporations. It wasn't just that fact that was accentuated through globalization, but we created a kind of ethos that we blame the victim as if, well, because it, you're not making that much money or somebody can do something cheaper abroad, then it's your fault. And I really came, it struck me about five years ago when I was talking to a person on the farm um, and he said to me, well, can't somebody do what you do cheaper? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, did you ever get up in the morning and somebody wrote a column in South Korea better than you did? And I said, no. He said, no. <laughs> and he said, well, if they could, don't you think you'd be replaced? And I said, yes. And he really, he had a point. And I don't like to read things, but I thought I, I would just read you a spectrum of what people said about the interior the people who were not connected in the global project. And almost, you'll see what I'm, it, it, um, I, I had hundreds of these uh, examples. And here's one from my own magazine, National Review, Kevin Williamson. This is a cover story, just two years ago. The truth about these dysfunctional downscale communities that they deserve to die. Economically, they're negative assets. Morally, they are indefensible. The white un American underclass is enthralled to a vicious, selfish culture whose main products are misery and used heroin needles. Donald Trump's speeches made them feel good. So does OxyContin. What they need isn't analgesics, literal or political. They need real opportunity, which means that they need real change, which means they need a U-Haul. Tell it to somebody who has three generations in a farmhouse or he's working in a plant in a community and you just tell him, you know, you, you lost, stupid, you didn't learn coding, get in a U-Haul. That's a very radical thing to do. It doesn't seem to have much Burkean or Tocquevillian uh, support. Here's one. We all remember ir irredeemables and deplorables. We forgot what Hillary said after the election to kind of reify that earlier statement and prove to us it wasn't a slip, but it was by intent. If you look at the map of the United States, there is all that red in the middle, places where Trump won. What the map doesn't show you is that I won the places that own two-thirds of the American gross domestic product. This is from a socialist. I won the places that are optimistic, they're diverse, they're dynamic, they're moving forward. And his whole campaign, Make American Great, was looking backward. You don't like black people getting rights, you don't like women getting jobs, you don't want to see that Indian Americans succeed succeeding more than you are. Whatever the problem is, I'm going to solve that. We sometimes forget that when Hillary ran in 2008, remember she said after getting off the plane, I have the support that Barack Obama doesn't. I have the white working class. And they got, Barack Obama got so angry he called her Annie Oakley. Remember that? Because she was drinking <laughs> boiler makers and bowling. That same class that she tried to cultivate that turned on her apparently, she's now turned on them. And then there was, um, this is from a conservative, Bill Crystal. Look, to be totally honest, if things are so bad as you say with a white working class, don't you just want to get new Americans instead? You can make a case that America's been great because it's a free society, a capitalist society. After two or three generations of hard work, these guys get decadent, they're lazy, they're spoiled, whatever. Max Boot, a colleague of mine on my military history task force at Stanford, kind of trumped that, if I could use that term. If only we could keep the hard-working Latin American newcomers and deport the contemptible Republican cowards, that would make America great. <laughs> and I'll finish with uh, a neighbor of ours at uh, the Hoover Institution, Melinda Byerly. She was a CEO at a uh, high-tech company, and she said after the election, one thing middle America could do is to realize that no educated person wants to live in a SHIT hole with stupid people, especially violent, racist, mis misogenic ones, when corporations think about where to locate call centers, factories, development centers, they have to deal with the fact that those towns have nothing going for them. No infrastructure, just a few bars and a terrible school system. If anybody's been to Palo Alto, you can see it's got some of the worst roads in the United States. And if you see the schools, the high-tech industry have abandoned the public schools and they're going to Parker or Sacred Heart or Castileo or the Menlo School. So even their exegesis is often flawed, but it shows a deep antipathy for what we call the losers of globalization. And 
that was the group that we know as the Tea Party, the Reagan Democrats, the mysterious 8 to 10, 12 million people who stayed home and supposedly cost Mitt Romney the 2012 election. And so there was this poll out there, and we had the finest, I think, cadre of Republican nominees that we'd had much better than 2012. I mean, there, I mean, there was Michelle Bachman and Herman Cain and all we didn't have those people in 2006. We had successful governors, Scott Walker, Bobby General, Senators, Rubio, Cruz. We had outsiders who were really talented, uh, Fiorina, Ben Carson. And yet we had this Manhattan real estate developer. And he was sort of like, uh, you know, the Pauli Pragmon of Athenian comedy that <laughs> screams and yells and rushes in, and uh, nobody quite knew what to do with him. And what he apparently saw, what this establishment group did not, that th this geographical divide could be leveraged. And he, he looked at the alternatives to it, and what the Republican establishment was basically saying is, we need a kinder, gentler Republicanism. We need to play by the Marcus of Queensbury rules. When Mitt Romney was in the second debate, and Candy Crawley sort of hijacked it, he didn't go out right, Reagan did and said, I'm paying for this or something. He just allow it to happen. Or, I mean, we haven't really had a Republican scrapper since Lee Atwater, remember him? What he did, I mean, he, he apologized for his tactics on his deathbed, but I mean, boy, when he got done with Mike Dukakis, he, the Boston Harbor pollution, the tank commercial, whatever you <laughs> felt, he was using the type of tactics that the left used, and there were people in this heartland that psychologically were as angry as they were hurting economically, and they just wanted somebody to fight back. Apparently, Trump, who was a product of the Manhattan dog-eat-dog -dog, uh, real estate and development world, knew that. So he kind of interloped in, and he saw that the Republican standard boilerplate, which we have, I mean, we're sort of famous at the Hoover for, and we're all supporters of free trade, free market economics, um, the post-war internationalist order that polices the world and gave us such prosperity. I, we all support it, but there was something wrong there that people in the heartland were pointing out, and that is um, if Germany is running a $71 billion deficit with the United States and it can't afford to have more than five fighters in the air and it's on the front lines of supposed enemies and it wants us to contribute more than 2% GDP but won't it will only contribute 0.6, and it will put a tariff on a U.S. automobile at 10%, and we have to put it at 2.5. That's an imbalance. NAFTA, I, I'm a big supporter of NAFTA. I thought I was, but $69 billion trade surplus with Mexico, and did NAFTA create a kinder, gentler Mexico? Is it a, is it a safer place? At $30 billion in remittances go every year back to Mexico. And you should see it in my hometown. People line up in the Western Union office, and they will put two or $300 in cash next to the cleaners. I go and watch it happen. Many of them are, on, or most, I think, are, have some sort of social support. And yet the president of Mexico, the beneficiary of trade subsidies, $30 billion, again, is channeled through cartels back into Mexico. And yet, did NAFTA make him a close friend of the United States? He said, you know, I have a sovereign right to protect people who are illegally in the United States. I want more people to leave, and immigration policy is not, is not your own. That wasn't supposed to happen under NAFTA. It just wasn't supposed to happen. I thought to myself, if Mr. Obador is elected on July 1st, what is he going to do? Is he going to say, I demand that uh, we get, go from $70 billion surplus to $100 billion trade surplus? with you? Is he going to say, I don't want your stinking $30 billion in remittances. It's too much a burden on our expatriates, so we're not going to take them. I want all of our 11 to 20 million people back in Mexico. They're Mexican citizens and they're proud people. We don't want them in your damn country. He's not going to do that. And that you, his rhetoric, if you take it to its logical extension, <coughs> would suggest that. And so these issues were ripe to be uh, manipulated on in the Republican establishment who kept saying, don't question NATO. NATO is essential to American foreign policy. It is, but it was never envisioned that countries on the front line wouldn't contribute a merely a me meager 2%. Don't question trade, but it was never, fair trade was never defined that China had the right to expropriate technology as a, as a process of doing business in, in China. 
And the idea was you started to see that the post-war order, it was ossified, it was calcified, it was predicated on the idea the United States is so strong and powerful that we can take a hit on trade, we can take a hit on NATO, we can take a psychological hit, we can intervene, we can create all, uh, we're sort of like Rome, if there's a Mithridates or there's a Jugurtha who's a troublemaker, Saddam or Gaddafi, we can handle it because we're so wealthy and we're so powerful and yet the country was hollowed out in the middle. And these people were saying, we're not that wealthy. It's not that good for us. I don't have a job at, a, at the car plant. I don't have a job at the, uh, as a lathe worker anymore. I don't have a, a 200-acre corn. It's not so good. Stop it. And nobody in the Republican side heard it. On the Democratic side, it was identity politics, demographic, or the future. And it was always, uh, we're going to identify you by your superficial appearance. Forget about assimilation, integration, intermarriage. It's going to be not the content of your character, but how you appear. And sometimes, I mean, because we're all linked, we, those are superficial differences, but my gosh, if we're gonna accentuate them, what do you do with my neighbors or in my family where people are one quarter Hispanic or one half? Or when I taught at Cal State Fresno, I, it was absurd. We needed a Hispanic, so we bring somebody from Argentina who was a multimillionaire, and suddenly he had three accent marks and a hyphenated name, and he was chairman, and we felt so good about diversity. <laughs> so you started to see that this whole movement would require a DNA. Uh, ultimately, the ultimate logic of it, we would have DNA badges, and that would you know, ascertain our ethnic purity. It's almost the one drop rule of the old Confederacy. So it was not headed in a, it's not headed in a good direction, yet when you saw it wanted a counterpoint to the, the Republican establishment played by the Marcus of Queensbury rule. We don't want to be called a racist, we can't be called a nativist, we're not a protectionist, we had all these words that we don't want to be called, but this sizable pool of people w was waiting. So Donald Trump came in, and he had a populism, that's a dirty word, but really in the history of Western civilization, there's two populisms. There's what the ancients called the good populism and the bad populism. We flipped it. The ancients' bad is our good, and their good is our bad. In the ancient world, the city, large urban populist underclass was railing for really two things, cancellation of debts, I, I lost Bernie Sanders, and redistribution of property and overseas imperialism. The entire Athenian imperial project was built on the backs of the Thetes. And the answer to that, or the answer to Catiline and uh, the late Roman Republic populism of, of Rome, which grew to be a million people, was the agrarian populism that said, no, we want a small farming uh, Contingency that uh, constituency, excuse me, that fights in the army. They they are agrarian. They vote, but they have some qualifications to participate in democracy. It's sort of what Edmund Burke was talking about: the power of legacy and custom and tradition. Or Tocqueville was talking about uh, an anecdote to radical equality. So that populism was there, and it was not considered dirty as it is today. It was a broad-based idea that a citizen has certain rights and responsibilities and living in the same place or honoring traditions of the past with, with understandable change when they needed to be changed was not a bad thing. And yet we had demonized that group and called them all sorts of names. So this was all there to be leveraged. There was one final ingredient that I don't know quite how Trump saw it if he did see it, and that was how do you uh, reify all of these existing situations into a political agenda that can win. And he, he focused on, I think, four issues. Globalization, which I talked about. Trade, which he said is not fair. We call it free, but it's not fair. And, and he had a very reductionist, simplistic attitude. He always would say, if you remember the debates, well, if it's so good, why doesn't Germany do, you know, adopt our policy? Or it's so good, why doesn't China do what we do? Or if it's so good, why doesn't these other countries do what we do. Or if it's so good that we have NATO, why doesn't Germany, per and so it was always, well, wait a minute, if it's so, if, if we're doing things so great and everybody else that has it so bad, why, are, why don't they just switch? And they didn't want to switch. People kind of made fun of it, but it was a powerful argument. The second thing was illegal immigration, and he, he really turned that issue to his advantage. He basically said, what is so moral or ethical 
about the first thing you do when you enter a foreign country is you break the law, and the second thing you do is you break the law by residing in it, not just breaking the law through the border. And he turned it almost to an ethical view. I went back and looked at speeches. It was always, well, these other guys are waiting in line, and they're trying to wait legally. This is not fair to them. And then he got onto the crime issue, and people would say, well, out of 13 or 14 million people, there's only a million people, so that's less than 8 or 9% have committed a felony. And he'd say, well, nobody should commit a felony. If a guy comes into your house, you have a higher expectation of behavior. And so he had these arguments that were not answered. And when they channel into globalization, that why do we lower the wages of Americans of the, of the lower classes, so to speak, or at least the entry level class. And that was an attempt to appeal to people on class rather than racial lines. It explains why the Haas, Haas School of Journalism just had a poll, if you remember, 54% of Californians want more deportation. 41, 49, excuse me, percent of Latinos poll they want more deportations. I was in the bank the other day and a woman said to me, a Hispanic woman that I've known since high school, she said, hey Victor, you seen ICE lately? And I said, I did see ICE lately. They just busted six people on my, about a half a mile from my house, covered with tattoos. They, you know, they came in with the pickups. They didn't look like cars. They had them all. She goes, oh, great. We call them all the time. They, we tell them what time they're going to be home. We want to, and I said, well, what's the consequences? And she said, the consequences are they call us from Oaxaca and tell us they're going to come back and kill us within a few hours of arrival. So it's, a, it's not what the media says. I don't find from autopsy and personal experience. That was another issue that, that really resonated that Trump saw that even though he was crude and clumsy and often cruel in the way that he articulated it. Then there was finally the, the post-war order and that was uh, the idea that going to Afghanistan or going to Iraq or bombing uh, Libya. And of course he was simplifying and he wasn't going to get we can call him an isolation, but he wasn't a Lindbergh isolate. We have 800 bases overseas. We still have 800 bases 200 years later. When he said bomb that blank out of ISIS, that meant intervening overseas and using military force for the common good. A lot of it was rhetorical, but not all of it. And I, I, this really, uh, when he started to say these things, um, and I supported the Iraq War, I remember I was in in bed for 2006 for a week and 2007 for two weeks during the surge. And I remember talking to all these guys over there, and they all fit a pattern below the, uh, the rank of colonel. They were mostly from the Midwest or rural upstate New York or places like Tulare, California. And they, they really read the papers, and I was thinking that the, a lot of the people who had really advocated for the war, not people who joined it and said, we might as well get rid of the SOB, he's a genocidal monster, but the project for the newest American century or all these people, I remember, do you remember the Vanity Fair in 2006 that was called ne uh, Neocon Regrets? And here were they were all there, the architects, and they all said it was a stupid idea, and basically it was, my brilliant war was ruined by your terrible peace. In other words, you just listen to me and not listen to X, Y, and Z, and therefore I don't support it anymore. And I thought what Matthew Ridgway said after Korea when they asked him, why in the hell did he go to Korea to bail out McCarthy? He said, there's only one worse thing than a bad war, and that's losing it. And that's what it was struck by people there. They were, they were saying, well, we didn't want to go over here, but once we're going to go over, let's get rid of the SOBs and win. And yet the people said, go over there, and we're going to remake the world in the, the image of Carmel. As soon as things got bad, whether it was Richard Pearl or, or other people, you said, I don't want any part of it. And that, and that resonated, too. So we had a lot of things uh, going for him that people didn't appreciate. And uh, the final demographic reality was, and a lot of people have written about this, yes, demogra demography is destiny, but if you start to look at individual rubrics, you can see that many of the new demographics were already in blue states. So by that I mean, yes, New Mexico has flipped, yes, Colorado has flipped, yes, Nevada has flipped, yes, California has flipped. It's very hard for a Republican president to start off when you're losing in addition 180 or so electoral votes with states like Illinois, New York, California, Minnesota, Michigan against you. But Trump had figured that some of these things were not going to flip. Georgia has a higher Hispanic population, Texas a much higher, but they weren't going to flip, not yet. But what could flip were these purple states 
Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, a lot of electoral votes and uh, a lot of disgruntled people. And he made the gambit or the bet that two things were gonna happen. He could appeal to those people in a way that Mitt Romney never could. So the conventional wisdom that Donald Trump is the only Republican of the six, 17 candidates who could lose is gonna be flipped on its head. He's the only one that could have won because he's the only one that would appeal on these issues I just mentioned in these states which had the electoral calculus for victory. And nobody quite appreciated that. And the second he appealed, he thought that the high uh, minority registration and turnout in some communities, a black community, probably 92% uh, of blacks voted for Obama, record turnout, uh, Asians perhaps 65, Latinos 65 to 70. That vote and that enthusiasm was not transferable to a 69-year-old white multimillionaire named Hillary Clinton with a lot of negatives. And those were two brilliant deductions that even though he lost the popular vote, it, it won. And so Republicans have not had 51% majority vote since Michael Dukakis election defeat in 1988, and they've lost five of the six last presidential elections at a time when they're very successful at the local and state level. And he understood that. I want to conclude is what in the world is he then? Is he chemotherapy that he is crude and can be obnoxious that's necessary to kill the administrative cancer? I, I've mentioned elsewhere, I think he's more like a tragic hero. Before you get angry and said there's nothing heroic about Donald Trump, well there's nothing heroic about a tragic hero as we understand the usual term hero. The word comes from Sophocles and Homer, Achilles, Ajax, Philoctetes, Oedipus, and what it means is that a particular individual is facing a tragic dilemma. That is, that they have the skill sets necessary to solve the problem or to address issues that cannot be addressed because of a calcification or a stasis in the situation. So if you're uh, the Achaeans on the plain of Troy, there's only one SOB that can kill Hector. The problem is he's not kingly. He's not Agamemnon, the deep state king, or Menelaus, his brother. But if you want some obnoxious young punk from Thessaly to go in and kill Hector Achilles is your man, but then you, what are you going to do with him when, he's, when you're done with him? And um, if you look at Ajax's soliloquies and Sophoclean plays, they're just Trumpian to the core. I should have got more credit for, for what I did at Troy. They didn't give me Achilles' armor. They cheated me. They rigged the election. He just, it's, it's just it's overwhelming. And we have these deep state characters in real life. If you remember Curtis LeMay, if, you want, if it's 1940, five and it's March and you've spent two billion dollars twice the cost of the Manhattan Project and you have 2,000 B-29s that don't work. In other words, they go up to 30,000 feet beautifully. They drop bombs on a 400 mile jet stream and the bombs are off target and you're losing 10% of your fleet every month because of the wear and tear of the engines and some nut with a cigar comes in and says, I'm gonna take those SOB planes and go down 6,000 feet and load them up with napalm and burn the industrial core then you can win the war. But what do you do with that person after the war? You don't want him around. You can put him in sack, or you can make him the character of Dr. Strange, like General Buck Turgeson, because that's how, or you can have him run with George Wallace and be sort of going to infamy. So we have, same with George Patton. You don't want George Patton as Allied <laughs> uh, Commander of Shape, the, the, uh, the invasion force and the Allied force. That's what you want Eisenhower for. You don't want him getting in front of cameras if you want a sober and judicious um, statement along Omar Bradley. On the other hand, you do not want Omar, Omar Bradley or Eisenhower controlling the complete strategy of the Normandy follow-up. You need somebody who knows how to fight and move fast and get to the Rhine with the fewest number of casualties. Then after the war, you do not put in this Bavarian proconsul, which we did, and he, you know, he lasted about six weeks. And then he was the stuff of character exactly a person who read Latin, spoke fluent French, very erudite, but he said things uh, and he addressed problems that could not be addressed and said in the way that he did so. We, I'll just finish with a, this genre we know from the Western. If you think of, I don't know, most people don't watch Westerns anymore, but you think of John Ford's classic The Searchers with John Wayne. Remember he has a really bad past, some kind of Confederate business, I don't know, he was in the Kansas uh, blood wars and he, we don't really know what he's going to kill Natalie Wood, his, his niece he's looking for. 
but people, if they want to find the kidnapped girl, they're going to have to bring him in. And when he's at, he, when he's done, you've got to open that door and make sure he walks out and does not stay around. To civil, he's not the kind of people civilizations are built. Remember the end of the Magnificent Seven. Uh, Yul Brenner says, <laughs> "Well, um, I guess we're going. They're very uh, happy now that we got rid of the bandits." He said, "Yeah, they're going to be even happier than when we leave." And what he was saying is that, and then he says, "We lose. We always lose." Same thing with uh, Shane. Uh, Shane is not the person that you want to go into that final gunfire and shoot at uh, Jack Palance and wound him in the hand or debate with him. You want him to kill him. And once he's killed him, he can't be a part of that society anymore. These are sodbuster civilizers. Same thing if you, uh, more of a modern analogy. You remember Dirty Harry movies at the end? Clint Eastwood really commits two, suicide, uh, two murders. He murders the Scorpio killer and gives him you feel lucky punk and blows him away, but by blowing him away, he blows away his own career. He, he murdered somebody. Same thing with a Denzel Washington man on fire. If you want to find uh, the, the kidnapped girl, then you gotta bring in Denzel Washington. When you bring in Denzel Washington, you get a whole other cargo of things you don't want. So the tragic hero is usually a person who decides to enter a situation which he's gonna lose, but he can be of utility. And I think that's sort of what Donald Trump did. I do not think there is a Republican politician running for office or in office who would have moved the embassy to Jerusalem, who would have got out of the Paris Climate Accords, who would have canceled the Iran deal, who would have told the, the North Koreans they're, they're dealing with some very serious problems, would have opened Anwar up, got the tax cut through, or tried to deal, uh, build a wall. I just don't think they exist, and I think the fact that somebody did do all of those things means that when they're accomplished, uh, the people he benefited in his party and the American people at large will be very happy to see him go. Thank you very much. <laughs>
I think those things are benchmarks. What whether he will succeed? Uh, there's a couple of other things. He's he's redoing the judiciary in a, in a very radical, I think, positive way. The two things that we'd all like him to address is uh, entitlement reform and um, the the deficit, and whether he can do that or not, uh, we'll see. Yes. I think, I think that's right. Uh, I think the reason that, that it's right, it's not only the chief obligation responsibility of the chief executive is his own people, but there's an, inclus an inclusivity about it. The more you start talking about American, have you noticed that Trump is the only candidate we've ever heard that used the first person plural pronoun, our? It sounds almost corny, but he says our farmers, our soldiers, our vets. You think Romney would ever say that, or even McCain? I don't think they'd ever use that word. Then he uses this weird word, beautiful. We're gonna have such beautiful steel, our beautiful coal plants. And it's a nationalist idea, but it brings people together. And I think that one of the reasons the subtext of the hatred of him is that if he were to be successful in creating sort of a working class nationalistic movement, that would transcend racial uh, categories. And I know that I live in a community that's 90% Hispanic and probably 40% illegal, I'm not supposed to say illegal, undocumented, but whatever. Uh, I would imagine that community was about 45% for Trump now. And I see it every day, I cannot believe it. But that's and, what I'm saying. And I think part of it is, he's, they see Trump as saying, I'm worried about your job, I don't care what you look like, I'm worried about your job, I'm worried about not sending you over to uh -huh. Afghanistan anymore, I'm worried about some guy in China who's ripping you off. And boy, and the other thing Trump has, he's a reductionist. So he believes that if unemployment gets down to 3.6, 3.7, then employers um, won't have any choice. They'll have to use American citizens if you close the border, and they will go into the inner city, and they will tell that inner city youth, they will communicate to them, you have the leverage now, not me. And people will bid for that person's labor. And Trump really does believe that. And, that, and there's a, there's a, a humanity, uh, humanity to that. That's one of my problems with the never Trumpers. When I hear all of this, the crudity that offends their social awareness or their class, I, I get kind of angry because I feel that, well, wait a minute, there's six million people that have jobs. The African American, there's 245,000, 250,000 African Americans that are working that weren't two years ago. That is a humane act. He needs to communicate that more, but that the ra I think you're right about the sovereignty issue. Yes, and you're right. I agree, and I think one of the things I did when he, I, I went back, it was kind of painful, but I did read Art of the Deal, Art of the Comeback, Art, uh, You Can Become a Big Billionaire, and they all have a common denominator in the negotiation, and it's always, you want 90% of a deal, you you just demand 90% edge, and then you, you scream in, that's number one, and then you're quite be happy with a 52% edge, 
but you're not going to get 52 unless you demand 90. And then the second, you act crazy and obnoxious, so the guy wants you out of the room. <laughs> and, and three, you bring up all sorts of intangible complaints that have nothing to do with the deal. You know, if you're dealing with a bank, you say, you know what, you screwed over my brother the other day, or I just read about it. That's what he does. And he, he is. And so I think that what we'll see is that we're not going to reduce that $360 billion Chinese trade, but if we reduce it by 100 billion in Germany's from 70, uh, 69, 71 billion down to, I don't know, 50, and Japan goes from 68 to, to, to 50, and then Mexico goes from 71, that will be considered success. And then more importantly, he's telling the electorate, it's not the duty of you in Columbus or in Ann Arbor, it's not, or not in Ann Arbor, Grand Rapids, it's not your duty to subsidize the world for some post-war project that's 75 years old now, uh, that you have to take an economic or military hit just for them. And of course, we've been beneficiaries of globalization in that post-war order, but I, I, I think that if, if it had gone on the way it was with the Republican establishment, the Republican establishment was headed, I think, into oblivion. Yes? Just to follow up on that, companies are immoral. Objective function is to increase shareholder value. Yes. I've been to China. I mean, you have major U.S. operations companies that are there employing. Like, I don't see them changing their behavior just because the president is talking about tariffs. I just wonder if I'm missing yeah. you, you don't see the companies. Yes. Multinational companies that have a U.S. nameplate, if you will, that are very, very active in the yes. international markets, changing anything because of what's happening in Washington. I don't. I, I don't know quite what they are, but I don't think that any chief executive could do more to be obnoxious to companies than Trump is. When he said to Harley Davidson the other day, I could not believe it. He said, you're not going to believe what's going to happen to you. And then he said the next day, you got a bunch of subsidies when you were in trouble, and now you're doing well and you're leaving. And he's doing that all the time. And I, the people that I, I deal with, so a lot of donors that I, I meet for the Hoover Institution and elsewhere, that's what bothers them the most, that they feel that he's jawboning them and telling them how to run their business based on nationalist concerns. It, it, I, I was a, an active farmer for about, without teaching or anything, just solely, and I remember when the price of commodities crashed in the 1983 recession, Ronald Reagan, we, we, a guy came out to speak to us from the Ag Department, and we complained that the EU were, were giving $400 a ton right off the top to any company or bakery or that would buy an EU Greek or Turkish raisin, not Turkish, but Greek or Spanish, rather than our raisins. SunMade went broke. They still owe me $88,000, which I'll never collect 35 years later. But the point I'm making was this free market guy who came out said to us, that's creative destruction. And I said, it's not creative. I was one of the spokesmen. I said, it's not creative destruction. They've got a subsidy. We don't. Well, it's going to be good for us in the long term. I said, why is that? I said, well, number one, those subsidies are not sustainable to them. You know, one day the EU will collapse. And then he said, number two, uh, it's going to be better for you because you're going to learn to produce raisins at $400 a ton rather than $1,300. And I said to him, well, how about you? You make $100,000. What if we just pay you $30,000? You'll be a lot more economical. Why is it always somebody else that has to be the victim of an abstract economic policy, even though it's a sound economic policy? And that's what... I think the Republican establishment missed. And, they, and the sad thing was they coined a term called com compassionate conservatism, and it was sort of a boutique, uh, I'm going to be, try to be as, as PC as the Democrats, whereas they should have had a populist <coughs> economic program that at least cared for the, the victims of globalization. Uh, yes, and we'll get back to you. Um, aside from the judiciary, yes. Giant aside, yeah. major success. Especially today. You know. Especially yeah. given today's news and the conference started. I mean, all these things falling apart. Falling it's great. But uh, aside from aside from that, it seems that partly because of the Republican Congress's challenges, shall we say, yeah. my concern is that some of the things that the president is attempting to do and is even doing are going to wither away again. Going back to the conference, due to our the bipolar nature. Of our society, the next people are going to come in and flip it all over because it's not law, it's executive. Order. No, you're absolutely right. He's 
in a weird way, he's emulating the Obama model. Obama was do the doctor, and he's the Frankenstein monster because he gave them the model of, of, of really expanding the chief executive. Remember, I have a pen and I have a phone. That's what Trump is doing. And it's because this Republican, the only thing that will change the Republican Congress, they're acting as a typical Congress, and we have political scientists here that know better than I, but when you have a president going into a midterm, or even after he's elected, and he's polling 40 to 45 percent, then you start to see these problems. If Trump were to have a big uh, a 4.5 percent GDP in, the, in this quarter, this ending, or he'll have a deal with North Korea, some spectacular, and he would be a little bit more disciplined. If he got up to 50, 53, 54 percent popularity, I think you'd see the congressional, because most Congress people have no ideology. <laughs> They're not Democrats. They just want to get reelected, and the, whether they get reelected is the presidential uh, polls as they go into a midterm. Mm -hmm. he Heather, Trump has some extraordinary apologists like yourself, and when I hear you speaking about Trump, he sounds wonderful. And, and I'm not a never Trumper. I voted for him, uh, but I feel like the, the people who are making this extraordinarily eloquent case are simply rationalizing the real. I think he's impulsive. You are, uh, according to him, a policy agenda that I, I just am not sure he has. I think he, he reacts at the moment, uh, and he can be very uh, vacillating, as we've seen with his flip-flops on DACA, uh, that he, he's seeking, in my impression, simply what will give him approval. Now, maybe, it doesn't matter what's inside of him and that he's, it's a hollow suit and that these are not deeply held convictions. What matters is what he accomplishes. Uh, and, and so, in fact, it doesn't matter. But, but I still think that we are, you are making an excellent case for somebody who, I, I watch him and I think, I don't get it. I'm seeing something very different than people like yourself. And yeah. My well, other, let me just see my other problem. How do I take... Well, I don't think you watched the Westerns that I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I was going to mention also Pike Bishop and Sam Peckinpah's The Wild Bunch. All of the people that I mentioned that were tragic heroes were killers. And they had certain skill sets that were necessary to break through, but they were not attractive people. But more importantly, let me, let me get you, give you an example. Can you address... I, I don't like the way that, uh, we'll put it this way. One of the key mistakes that has been made was Jeff Sessions' acquiescence to being recused. There was no real reason that he should have. He could have fought that. I think it would have been acrimonious, but had he not recused himself, the Mueller investigation and Rod Rosenstein would have been neutralized. That being said, once he made that decision, it would be very hard to remove Rosenstein. So. I don't like what Trump does when he publicly berates somebody. He does that a lot. Yeah. And I, I don't find that, and I said that I wish that he would improve his behavior. But I, I want to make one last point. One of the things I get really angry is when I meet never Trumpers is they always bring up Reagan. Reagan was a statesman. Or I see an editorial by Ron Reagan Jr. I lived in this state, and I can tell you, as you did, Ronald Reagan signed the first tax withholding plan. Ronald Reagan signed the most radical abortion law that we had up to that point. Ronald Reagan, the senior statesman, said right during the People's Park, if we're going to have a bloodbath, let's get it over with. When he ran for office, he said, I'm running to make sure that these bums get a job. Then he said, right during the SLA, Patty Hearst thing, when they had to give the food giveaway, he said, I, where's botulism? You know, I'd like to see some botulism. <laughs> and I could go on. But what happens is, once these guys are out of office, then we romanticize them. We don't talk today that George W. Bush was called a Nazi, a fascist. I couldn't believe it when Laura Bush said that the other day about the Japanese interpreter. Very false historical analogy, because that's exactly what they said about her own husband. So. I wish that he were more sober and judicious. Uh, I wish that he wouldn't have these gyrations that you quite correctly spot. But I think people in the past have done that. All I'm concentrating now on basically is what is the concrete result and have the means so 
infuriated us or been so beyond the pale that they have canceled out the ends. I think, we, I, I think that really we have to take a deep breath and say to ourselves, who was the person who said, take a gun to a knife fight? Who was the person right during this Maxine Waters thing? Who was the first person to say, get in their faces? Who was the first person to bring a rapper into the White House whose current cover had a dead white judge with his eyes X'd out where black rappers were toasting them while the other rapper's ankle bracement went off in the White House? And if he, Trump trivializes things, he hasn't had Glozell yet come and interview him. So I think a lot of it's the perspective that we have. And uh, if Trump, uh, I don't like the things he gets in with Meghan McCain and John, uh, um, John McCain. And, but I, I went back and reviewed all this. And one thing that was striking, he's a coiled rattlesnake that retaliates. People, for all the horrible things he said about John McCain, John McCain had just said a very terrible thing. He said that the people who support Trump are the crazies that come out. The crazies. He said that about people. And, you know, uh, a lot of these people, uh, he's chemotherapy is what I'm saying. And he's a catharsis to the whole thing. But he's not an attractive character in, in many ways. Yes, you have a question. One word you haven't used to describe him that I'm, I'm a huge fan of Donald yeah. Trump, yeah. a lawyer educated, and yeah. mother of two. Um, and we vote for him again in a heartbeat. Is Rodney Dangerfield? Yeah. Well, he's. Uh, I, I actually have said that in an interview. Oh, okay, well, then I apologize, yeah. so I'll let you have credit. But, yeah. um, I, I think he is, uh, and he's the bit, if you remember, I Caddyshack think. character, especially you when, if you remember the movie sales. with Ted Baxter, Ted yes. Baxter is the Republican establishment, <laughs> <laughs> and Trump is, is Raji Dangerfield. But the, the, point, the point I'm making is that, is that his base, if you will, they feel like they're Rodney Dangerfield, too. They do. And so I think, honestly, that even though he's a billionaire living in his tower, which is pretty gaudy, that he truly identifies with this populist. No, he does. And, and you, that you, you hit it on the head, and that's why some of the brightest minds in political science miss him, because they couldn't, they couldn't square the circle of how can a billionaire gaudy uh, exorbitant, arrogant guy uh, appeal to somebody that's out of work, and the answer is take a look at his tie, or take a look at his diet, or take a look at his girth, or take a look at his hair. Yeah, I'll give you an, an, one one real brief anecdote, and that was uh, I had to meet a very wealthy donor, and he said to me, a Jewish guy in Palm Beach, and he said, because I had so much money, I made so much money. He was like, that. But he said, when I got down here, no Jewish club would let me in on Palm Beach. And then I went over to the non-Jewish and they wouldn't let me in either. So I said, well, how'd you get in tomorrow? Well, I'll go. And he said, Donald Trump called me up. I said, Donald Trump called you? He said, yeah, I hear you've got a lot of money. <laughs> and he said, I want you to come in here. And I said, uh, well, did you do it? And he said, yeah. And the first thing I asked is, how much does it cost? And he said, depends on how much money you have. <laughs> and he said, well, do I have to pay more because I'm have to? i so rich? He said, no, you paid less <laughs> because I'm going to tell everybody that you're in my club. So I said, what happened? He said, we played golf for two years every Monday. I said, so he cheats, doesn't he? I said, yeah. He said, absolutely, he cheats. And I said, then he makes bets, I read, and he never pays you. He said, one, one at Golf Alley with him, and he's bet six times, he's lost all six times, and he owes me $5,000. And then he said he can't find his ball or his checkbook. <laughs> so I said, well, why don't, you, why don't you dislike him? Because those are, those are really personal traits that are integral to a president. He said, because just when he does that, he walks over to a caddy and hands him $1,000 and says, I heard your kid has gotten a wreck. Or he runs over to another guy and says, well, you need to upgrade that car. It's a disgrace to my thing and gave him one more car. So there's something about that that it, it, we haven't quite figured, quite figured him out yet. But one thing I, I think we have to really avoid, all of us, is this post facto puritanical idea that we have of the American Republic that it's never been this tawdry before. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was having an affair Lucy Mercer inside the White House using his daughter Anna as a conduit to make sure that was happening. Harry Truman was drinking, smoking, 
cigars, playing cards. He went after a, a critic of his daughter and called him an idiot and said he was basically going to emasculate him. He said about Trump, uh, Douglas MacArthur, five-star general, I should have sought, fired that SOB a long time ago. And he was a very crude, he said in the 48 election, uh, basically Tom Dewey was a Nazi. Terrible thing about a good man. So we've had very successful presidents that have been not very nice people. I mean, so far, Donald Trump has not taken his phallus out, held it in his hand, said to his cabinet, does Ho Chi Minh have anything like this? <laughs> That's what Robert Carroll said that LBJ did. And when he wanted to humiliate an aide, he defecated in the toilet while he dictated to it. So we have things that have gone on in this country that before the age of Facebook and the internet and globalized instant communication and this crass culture that we're not we, you know, we, we weren't aware of, but this idea that, that uh, you know, I, I just don't think that the presidency, and I, I want it to be good, and I think Trump tarnishes it sometimes, but I, I don't like the idea that we create this artificial image of ourselves, which never was there. One more. One more. Uh, yeah. So, given, given all the characteristics that the president talked about, you've got this nice summit he had with the North Korean and then you've also got him pulling out of the Iran deal. Where do you think that goes? I mean, I've heard a lot of criticism. Well, he knows how to pair these things up. He doesn't know how to make these deals. And I'm just wondering what your thought is on, do we get anything meaningful with this dictator North Korea or out of Iran? Or is it, is it just the same stalemate we've been in? For well, one of the ironies, I think, of all of this uh, exhibition, and you're absolutely right, that we don't know what the rhetoric is, and we, we do know that Donald Trump is a, he is a narcissist, and he's thin-skinned, and he wants to be the center of attention. I get that. But he has assembled the most, I think, talented foreign policy team. If you look at Nikki Haley at the UN, and you look at Mike Pompeo at State, much better than <laughs> Rex Tillerson, and now you, you Bolton and Mattis, you've got a, a unique group of people. And so what are they doing Why Trump is doing? Now Trump is not the... Um, bad cop, and they're the good cop, like Tillerson. They're the bad cops. And Trump is going around telling Kim Jong-un, you know, I got these nuts called Bolton. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I know this for a fact because I've talked to people in the State Department and the Defense Department, and they tell me again and again for the first time, the United States is saying to North Korea and China, the next round of nuclear proliferation will be Japan and Taiwan and South Korea, and these missiles will be pointed at you, not us, and you broke the convent. You let your dog off the leash and got nuclear. We didn't, but they're, go they're going to go nuclear. And then they're saying to China, there's trade ramifications, and we're going to keep doing this with Australia. And that is the first time a president's been serious. But to make that work, it wouldn't work with Mark Mitt Romney as president, because if Mitt Romney was asked, he'd say, I'm just abhorred by the idea that Japan would go nuclear. So Trump exaggerates, and, but beneath all this, same thing with the Iran deal. You know, you, you want to get out of Iran and do this and this, and then but under the radar, these people are very adept. If you've been reading these sanctions around, they're having protests in the streets. They're really starting to bite. And then he's telling people in Europe and in the Middle East, as I understand it, that same thing. E Egypt, Saudi Arabia will go nuclear if Iran goes nuclear, and they're going to be pointing missiles at Iran, not us. And they're telling China, uh, look at your borders. You've got a nuclear, look at China and Russia, that area. You've got nuclear India, you've got nuclear Pakistan, you've got nuclear North Korea. Do you really want a, a, a nuclear North Korea, nuclear Iran? And so uh, what I'm saying is I would be very worried if Trump had a bunch of Steve Bannons, whom I know and like, but nevertheless, I would not want Steve Bannon doing these negotiations. So he's got some very good people there, and he, uh, he seems to understand that, and he's comfortable with them. So uh, he's playing a role. I know it's, it's a danger, always bad cop, good cop, and you'll have to deliver. But so far, the country's in good hands with the people he's appointed at state, defense, national security, and UN ambassador. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Um, we begin tomorrow at 8.30 in the morning uh, with a light topic of religious liberty <laughs> and its connection to conservatism and its importance in building, as we've been discussing and making the case for, this uh, conservatism of connection. And so I hope you've really enjoyed uh, the evening thus far. Uh, I know uh, several of you came up to me saying, wow, I've never been in a conversation like this before, or a conference like this. And, and that certainly was our goal, Rich, right? I mean, it was our goal to put together something based on a unique set of arguments. And uh, Gary, as you've said, uh, how timely that we're kicking this off today. Thank you so much for tonight. Look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Thank you.